on this computer. Right, coming in and joining us. Um, Thank you. Really, oh, it's really good to have you. We're also pleased to have Sebastian with us too, taking care of the technology. So thank you, Sebastian, for making sure we're all safe and well. Um, anybody has any tech issues at all, Sebastian's right there to look after us, make sure we're doing okay. And we also, I think, Lewis, you've got some breakout rooms planned for us as well. So Sebastian will take care of that mm -hmm. too. Um, and it's also a good time to let us know if you're not able to access the breakout rooms as well. So you can maybe use a little acronym in your name, like NBR for no breakout rooms, or let us know in the chat room. And of course, if you can, that also really extends the learning experience in the workshop too. So yeah. Um, what else to say? Sebastian, thank you for the phone number and the email address too. Um, Miguel is on our help desk also so that's more support even um, if that would be helpful you can give Miguel a little call or an email um, we are recording these couple of hours together as well so and some colleagues have purchased the recording too so um, who might be here looking forward to watch that again or who are not here and uh, might watch that later um, and if you've missed that opportunity, we can put the, um, the link in the chat room as well if you want to catch up with us later. And just if you've been with us before on a workshop that we're recording, you'll know that we're just recording whoever's got the microphone unmuted. So right now that will just be Lewis and myself. Um, although I can I see there's a couple of microphones maybe that we might just mute in a moment um, just for background noise. But you might, as we go through the workshop, want to use your microphone. You might have a comment for Lewis or you might have a question. And if you do, the recording will um, automatically record you, which you might be really fine with. And if you'd like your question or comment to be edited out, you can either let Sebastian and I know with a private message or you can send us um, an email at online events so we can make that edit. And of course, as we have been doing already, we can use the chat room for questions and comments too. So I think, Lewis, you were saying you might kind of pause every now and again and just check in with us mm. to see if there's anything that we might want to ask. Lewis. Right, right. I will do that. So I, just checking my notes, I think that's all the things we'd usually say. Oh, we've got the subtitle option on on zoom as well i think that's um or just about to be switched on so if anybody uh, thank you sebastian that's great if anybody would find that useful you should see a little button at the bottom of zoom to click that says live tran is it live transcript it's not quite showing up on my um yes live transcript you click the live transcript button you get a little pop-up and then you can click show subtitles um, and there's a little computer somewhere trans transcribing what I'm saying and then what you'll be saying, Lewis, into text. So it, it's not 100% accurate because it's a machine somewhere, but it can be a, a kind of helpful additional resource. So, yeah. so welcome everybody to Therapeutic Stories, Transmit the Values of Altruism and Concern for Others with Lewis Mel Madrona and... Lewis, over to you to say your hellos and get us started for these next couple Great. of hours. Yeah, this is exciting to be talking to people from across a vast expanse of water. And uh, it's kind of fun. And I'm going to show you some images. I'm going to bring them up now and introduce myself as we go. Um, so um, I work with the five indigenous nations of Maine. I'm the medical director at Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness. And we also, I also work with a not-for-profit, which I think you call an NGO, uh, Coyote Institute, whose goal is to infiltrate 
uh, the modern world with indigenous wisdom. And um, I just wanted to say how grateful I am to John and to the organization for making this event possible. And to acknowledge that I speak to you from the unceded territory of the Penobscot Nation. And I want to acknowledge their elders, past, present, and future. This is not a medical conference, so I don't have to worry about disclosures, but I always have that on my slide anyway, because uh, at medical conferences, everybody wants to know if you're getting any money from drug companies. And I've never gotten any money from drug companies. <laughs> they don't like me. So, But I do have some books that you might actually buy. And so um, I might actually someday get a royalty check though I'm not holding my breath. So I want to, I want to, I, I haven't forgotten to introduce myself a little more, but I wanted to tell you a little creation story. Um, and one of the things that I learned in Australia from an elder in East Gippsland, from the Gurnai Kurnai people, um, he said that, his name was Albert, by the way, and he made, he made us some wicked boomerangs and clock sticks. Um, but, um, and that's a Maine expression, by the way. I don't know if you say that in England, but in Maine, everything is wicked. So people are wicked smart and people are wicked mean and coffee is wicked good. The coffee uh, shop next to our office is wicked brew. So uh, you'll probably hear me say wicked a few times. And I just want you to know that it's a main expression. So, uh, so it, anyway, Albert said in Australia, there's 450 creation stories and they're all different and they're all true. And so after the appropriate pause, one says, how so Albert? <laughs> and then he said, because they're all true for the people who tell them in the place where they're told. And so one of the things that I want to get at is the locality of stories today, because stories come from a place and are told in that place and may not have the same meaning when taken out of that place. And so I'm, as we go through today, I'm going to invite you to think about the stories that teach altruism and connectedness with others from the place where you live. And I, I know um, I've taught a lot in the north of England, in um, Penrith area. And I know that there's many Celtic stories that abound in that vicinity. And going further north into Glasgow, we've taught in um, Glasgow and uh, Aberdeen. And so we know that there are many local stories that you can draw from, from your location. So this is one of those creation stories and some photographs of the place where it's told. So the, it, it begins with the people emerging from the earth, coming out of the earth into a misty fog, a fog that was so thick that they couldn't see anything but pillars of fire in each of the four directions. And they had to make a decision. So they chose the red fire of the North, which warmed them and enabled their plants to grow and taught them to respect all of the elements of nature. And, and it was known that if the people failed in their respect for nature and neglected their ceremonies, the people would disappear from the land and it would fall beneath the water of the ocean. And so uh, that's an intro and it, it speaks to the awareness of the people who told that story of the consequences that we're now facing with global warming and and how um, already land is 
becoming covered by water. This is happening in the South Pacific. Uh, Miami Beach, Florida is already underwater and pumps are working 24 hours a day to keep it dry. So um, just a thought to share about how some indigenous people knew already about the crisis of global warming, even as they invented their creation story. So this is where I grew up. This is a map of the United States. You'll notice that Maine is cut off of this map. Most people in the United States think we're in Canada anyway. So that's okay. Um, and this is my lake. This is my river. And uh, my maternal lineage is Cherokee with some Greek intermixed. This is a typical Cherokee village as it looked in the 1600s. And these are three Cherokee leaders who visited England in 1730. And it, it's fun because you see that they don't wear the classic TV headdress that actually only Plains Indians wore. And this is a picture from the 19th century of a woman fishing in that same river that I showed you earlier. And of course, we, we always have to acknowledge the genocide that happened in the United States. And some of you don't know about that. And if you wanna read more about the genocide, there's a book by Thomas King called The Inconvenient Indian. And, uh, it's a really good summary of what happened. So this is the Trail of Tears and Death in which the Cherokee people were rounded up in the middle of winter, in the middle of the night and marched at gunpoint to Oklahoma, to Indian territory. And one third of them died on the trip. This is the man who was chief of the Cherokee nation during the march, John Ross. And uh, this is uh, one of our ceremonies, the green corn dance. A Cherokee summer kitchen, a Cherokee winter home made out of stone. And this is kind of funny because you'll see the headdress that the man is wearing for the tourists, and which is not Cherokee, as I pointed out earlier. And I love this picture because this man looks exactly like my grandfather who loved bluegrass music. This is a Cherokee bluegrass band from Kentucky. So my father's people come from South Dakota and uh, near Wounded Knee. So I'll just show you some images of that. And um, in the book that I wrote called Coyote Medicine, there's the story of jumping mouse and um, buffaloes play a prominent role in that story. And if we have time, I'll tell it. Uh, though it's not a story, well, it's sort of a story of altruism. So we may fit it in actually, uh, come to think of it. But uh, this is what the reservation looks like and the Black Hills in the distance. This is the, the site of the Wounded Knee Massacre. And uh, 393 unarmed men, women, and children were killed by the US Army in one fell swoop with a Gatling gun. And this is the memorial. This is my favorite um, doctor, Charles Eastman, who was the first Dakota physician. You may be interested, he helped found the Boy Scouts of America. And this is Adam Beach playing him in the HBO movie, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. The real guy looks a lot friendlier than Adam Beach, I think. <laughs> and by the way, you can download his books. He wrote 17 books and they're all free downloads now. So if you just type in his name, 
uh, you you can read his his books. So I, I just wanted to show you some images of our ceremonials. Uh, this is our Inipi Kaga. Inipi means they breathe, and Kaga means ceremony. So literally, it's a they breathe ceremony. And uh, Lakota is a verb based language. So we have another ceremony, Iwipi Kaga, which is uh, they tie him up ceremony. And then we have a Lawampi Kaga, which is a singing in the dark ceremony. So, and the list goes on. I just thought you'd, be, you'd enjoy seeing some images from where I come from, from where I live, before we get into the stories. Just because it is different from England, I think. That we have built these structures in the Lake District and done ceremony there. And I can tell you with some interest that the Scottish, rich, the Aboriginal Scottish people did uh, lodges like ceremonies like this, only they built them out of stone. And what's so interesting is that they had the stone masonry technology to build a dome like structure, a small dome like structure without any cement or glue or anything to hold it together. And my Celtic friends in Inverurie are still trying to figure out how to do that because it takes an incredible know-how. And they, for the, for the time being, they're using um, saplings like we do and, and uh, tarp coverings like we do, but they're committed to figuring out the Celtic technology of stone masonry. And this is an, a cool picture from the 19th century. You see, it pretty much looks the same today as it did then. And a nice view of our rocks. This is our sacred mountain and the Sundance ceremony, a drawing of the Sundance. This is a Cree style Sundance. This is a Lakota style Sundance. This is uh, what it looks like after everyone goes home. And um, sometimes there was a one person Sundance and sometimes many people. So I just wanted to show you some images of, of my world so that you could contextualize me in a way. And I, I also need to acknowledge uh, my Swedish ancestors who worked for the Gordons as Lancers they were the Gads, which in Swedish referred to a warrior who fought with the lance on horseback. And so apparently my family is entitled to wear the Gordon Tartan by virtue of having been their employees. So for what that's worth, my European ancestors come from Sweden and Greece. My North American from Cherokee in, in Kentucky, Tennessee, and Lakota in South Dakota. So before we talk about, before I tell you some stories, which I'm going to do, I want to talk about what is a story. And a story contains action from a beginning to an ending. And it, it's embodied in a location and it contains characters. It conveys a meaning or a message, values and emotions and it has to be plausible and engaging to the audience in order to accomplish its purpose. So um, the shortest story I know was told to us by a client who said, um, once upon a time, my boyfriend killed me. That was when we were living in Florida and selling Coke. Then I woke up. <laughs> so <laughs> it's interesting. How, how did she wake up from being killed? She's, she contextualizes it. It has a beginning and an ending. Uh, it has all the elements. So, and it's got two characters and it's quite short. So you see a story can be quite short. It, and we tell vignettes to each other all day long. That's what we do. 
is tell little short stories to each other. And, and there's no culture that exists without stories. And I, I think there's even a robot movie. Uh, maybe it's iRobot, I'm not sure. But the robot is asked the question and its answer is, that reminds me of a story. So uh, all people and possibly even robots use stories to, to share meaning and purpose and to uh, communicate, to understand each other. And um, memory is, is formed and stored as stories. I hope you'll enjoy my amateur nature photography, uh, which accompanies these slides. And um, so, and maybe I'll, if we have time, I'll tell you the story of how I pet, petted a wild kangaroo and how, how, what that required. So um, we use stories to construct our notion of reality. And I think what's interesting is that Alzheimer's dementia preferentially attacks story brain. And so when you lose all your stories, you become a being without a self. And um, as I said, mostly we don't pay attention to the stories that we tell because it's so natural to us. Um, but I'm, I'm going to invite us to think about it more purposeful, purposefully today and to think about what are the stories that teach altruism, that teach cooperation. And I think this is important because we desperately need to be cooperative and to stop being so competitive in order to survive as a species. And um, we need to teach our children cooperation and altruism. So we need to tell them stories that share those values. We need to create a memory structure that's altruistically friendly and that gives meaning and purpose to altruism. So, um, so we wanna construct a social identity that's compatible to human survival. And so I'm gonna tell you one such story. And this is uh, my house. Uh, this is what it looks like right now. <laughs> you can see we, we dug out a place to sit in the chairs <laughs> in the snow. And um, so I'm gonna tell you a story about Gluscap. And I have to preface this by saying that uh, Gluscap is the cultural hero of the Wabanaki people. Wabanaki means, Aki means people, and Waban means white. And so the literal translation is people of the whiteness. And the, the metaphorical translation is people of the dawn. And there's a beautiful movie called Dawnland that addresses um, the Wabanaki people. And also another fascinating movie called uh, Gathering which looks at food security of the Wabanaki people. And um, so my job is to think about the health of the Wabanaki people, which is intimately interconnected with their food and housing and living conditions and things like that. Gluscap is really tall. And Gluscap was sent by creator to uh, clean up the earth because creator was a long distance away and couldn't really be bothered with the fine print of creation. The, in everywhere in North America that I'm, of which I'm familiar, creator does not have gender. So creator is uh, genderless. And I can say the word the word in Lakota for creator is 
Dakushkashka, which literally means that which is the whitest. And the metaphorical translation is that which moves all that moves. And I'm not sure how they get from the literal to the metaphorical translation, but some elder somewhere knows. So we'll leave it at that. There's always mysteries everywhere. So Glooscap wanted to go duck hunting. And he saw some ducks out on the lake and he thought, those are plump looking ducks. That looks like a yummy lunch. And so he got in his canoe and he started to, to go toward the ducks, but the wind was so strong that he couldn't make any headway. He just paddled and paddled and paddled and he got nowhere. And it made him very angry. He was so angry at the wind. He said, this has to stop. This is interfering with my lunch. And so he went to his trusted grandmother. This is another interesting mystery. How does Glooskap have a grandmother? When you figure that out, let me know. I'll be, I'll be very grateful. And his grandmother is a woodchuck. Now, I don't know if you have woodchucks in England, but they certainly have them in Europe and they call them marmots. They also call them marmots in Canada. So um, in Maine, we tend to call them woodchucks. And we, have, we say, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck chucked wood and things like that. But his, so his grandmother, woodchuck, knows everything really. She's his trusted advisor. She's so wise. And Glooskap said, grandmother, where does the wind come from? And she said, oh, Glooskap, don't you know there's, there's a big eagle on top of the tallest mountain and that eagle flaps its wings and that creates the wind. Ah, said Glooskap, I see. And grandmother Woodchuck said, Glooskap, I fear that you're thinking evil thoughts. Be careful. And he says, oh yeah, 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 I'll be careful. And so Glooskap, he knows where the tallest mountain is. In Maine, it's called Mount Katahdin, which is a sacred mountain. And so Glooskap march, starts marching right up that mountain. And as he goes, the wind gets stronger and stronger and stronger and it blows off all his clothes. And it gets even stronger and it blows off all his hair. And by the time he gets to the eagle, He's a naked, hairless guy. And he says to the eagle, hey, dude, creator sent me here to, to move you over to this other mountain. Creator thought that would be a better mountain for you. And the eagle said, oh, OK. And Glooskap says, hey, I brought this here rug that the wind didn't blow away. So why don't I wrap you up in that and I'll just carry you over to that other mountain. And so eagle says, OK. So Glooskap wraps him up in the rug, carries him over to the other mountain and stuffs him down head first into a hole. And Glooskap says, there, now I can go fishing. And so Glooskap comes all the way back down the mountain to where the lake is. And he, and he notices it's starting to stink, starting to smell really bad. And the insects, oh my God, they're so horrible. The insects are just really awful. And biting, stinging, and it's just terrible without a cool breeze. It's so hot and sticky. And he tries to get out to the ducks, but they've all flown away because they don't like the smell and the conditions of the lake. And so, Glooskap comes back to his grandmother. His grandmother says, all right, Glooskap, tell me what you did. How come there's no wind? And so he tells her. And she said, Glooskap, don't you know that everything is connected? You can't just be selfish like this. You can't just change things for your own benefit. 
because when you do, you hurt others and, and ultimately you hurt yourself. So go fix this. Louis Gap sheepishly says, all right, I'll go fix it. And this time there's no wind to blow away his clothes or his hair. I don't, that's another mystery how he could grow his hair so quickly back, but he did. And so he goes up and he pulls the eagle out of the hole. And he says, oh, uncle, I've come to rescue you. And the eagle said, well, that's good because this naked hairless guy stuffed me down this hole and that was no fun at all. And Glooskap says, well, I'm here to put you back where you belong. And so Glooskap carries the eagle back to its perch on top of the mountain. And the wind has been present with us ever since. And no one has thought to take it away ever since then, because we learned the consequences of being selfish. <clears throat> Here's another picture of um, my Anipi Kaga structure from home. The tarp is there to keep the, so to make it easy to shake the snow off. There's a whole technology living in snow, which some of you don't have to learn um, in England. I don't know, I know it snows in the Lake District, but I know that it doesn't stay very long. So, but I think it must snow in Northern Scotland. So before I, I launch into the next story, is there is there anything in any discussion in the chat or comments that we should address, John? I'm not seeing any questions yet. I want to say thank you to Christine, who's been putting links into some of the books that you mentioned. Oh, thank us. you. Thank you. So we've got, um, I like the Inconvenient Indian, um, Curious Account America, um, and the Deep. Deep Woods Civilization sequel. So yeah, thank you, Christine, for that. Has, is there any questions or comments anybody wants to make in the chat room? Or I think we've got the microphones muted but unlocked if anybody wanted to unmute and make a comment as well. So yeah. I'm really enjoying the story, Lewis. So it's been all right. Really enjoying that, and and lovely to set you in your context as well. Really appreciate that. It's something that we often don't do in the more technological world. So it's really lovely that you bring those things together, Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to another story. This is also a story from Maine, and it also features Glooscap. Now I told you that Glooscap was rather large. And so it was difficult for him to find a nice warm bathtub. And one of the things you should know is that 4,000 years ago, the Gulf of Maine was quite warm. And there were even swordfish playing in the Gulf of Maine. And Glooscap thought that he had found the perfect inlet for constructing a bathtub. And Glooscap went to Beaver and said, hey, little dude, would you build a dam across this inlet so I can have a bathtub? And Beaver is like, well, yeah, I could do that. I can do anything. And so Beaver gets to work. And it's a architectural marvel. It's one of the greatest dams that you've ever seen. And Glooskap was so pleased to have a bathtub. And Beaver was so pleased to have constructed such a marvelous feat of engineering. When what should happen but whale should appear? And whale said, you guys, this is my favorite lunch spot. You know, what's available for me to eat in this bay is so yummy that there's nothing like it anywhere else. And so you got to take down this dam. And Glooscap, who learned his lesson about uh, respecting others from the previous story I told you and a number of other stories, says, all right, Beaver, we got to take the dam down. And Beaver says, no way. I want to show this to everyone. This is 
This is like my greatest life work. I'm not taking it down. Whereupon Whale, with one slap of her tail, broke the dam, causing the cold water to flow in and out. And it's been flowing in and out ever since. And so um, that's a kind of a cool story because the tides in the Bay of Fundy, which is an offshoot of the Gulf of Maine, the Bay of Fundy separates us from Nova Scotia and separates Nova Scotia from New Brunswick. So if you know your North American geography, you'll know exactly where it is, or you can look in a map. But um, so this story about blue scap beaver and the whale appeared about 3,400 years ago. And this is a story told by an elder from Eskasoni First Nation in, uh, I was going to say Nouvelle Ecosse, but it's in English, it's Nova Scotia. Sorry, <laughs> I had a moment of blockage there. And um, anyway, this is the explanation for the tides in the Bay of Fundy, which are the highest in the world. So there's a 20 meter difference between low tide and high tide in the Bay of Fundy. And Albert Marshall, the elder, tells this story as an example of indigenous wisdom. So this is the indigenous explanation for the tides. The geophysical explanation is that 3,400 years ago, there was a perfect confluence of two underwater volcanoes erupting in the Gulf of Maine, a hurricane coming through, an earthquake, and intense heavy winter runoff from a huge amount of snow that winter. And the combination caused this narrow isthmus of land to collapse. And the blowing of the volcanoes allowed the cold water to rush in. And that's the geophysical explanation for the tides. I sort of prefer the glue scap explanation myself, but you can take either one. And Albert's point is that they're both valid that they're both good explanations. So um, now I'm gonna tell you a Lakota story that teaches values as well. And it's about Bear, Badger, and the Avenger. And the Avenger is an interesting Lakota character who um, appears for the first time in this story. And then uh, becomes part of a cycle of stories of the righting of wrongs, uh, the, the um, creation of justice in the face of injustice. And, uh, and so the Avenger through that cycle of stories teaches um, the notion of respect for others, that this is paramount, it's important. So we begin with Badger who lived in a marvelous den and who was an excellent hunter. And um, Badger's den was full of, of dried meat and dried berries and all of the things that one needs to get through the winter. And there were so many furs that, from the animals that Badger had trapped that his wife had cured and, and made into soft blankets and covers for the little badgers and for mama and daddy badger. And so the badgers were living a, an excellent life in their den at the edge of the forest. And one day badger stayed home from hunting because he needed, <coughs> sorry, he needed to make some new arrows. And I mean, periodically a hunter needs to do that. 
And who should appear at the entrance to the den but Bear? And Bear looked terrible. He was scruffy looking. His fur was not shiny. Just quite a mess. And Badger said to Bear, Bear, what's wrong? You don't look so well. And Bear said, um, we haven't had enough food this winter. And Badger said, well, sit down and, and have some food. And so Bear was placed in the seat of honor, and which is in Lakota, is in the west of the dwelling, and uh, was fed until his belly was full. And so Bear left. But to everyone's chagrin, he kept coming back every day. Well, that's not being a good guest. You don't come back every day and eat someone else's food. Imagine if somebody did that to you, you'd start to get annoyed with them. And that was exactly how Badger felt. But being uh, extremely polite as Badgers are wont to be, he didn't say anything, nor did his wife, but they kept feeding Bear. And Bear grew healthy looking and had a shiny coat and just looked great. But one day Bear showed up with his whole family, his wife and his little cubs. And he said to the badgers, I'm taking over your den and all of your food. Get out. Badger couldn't believe it. He said, this is my home. Bear said, not anymore. I'm taking it. Get out. And so Bear started throwing the cubs out the entrance and the two adult badgers quickly skedaddled, grabbing what they could on the way out. Bear was triumphant. I've got the food, I've got the den, I've got everything I want. Well, Badger was in sad shape, he had no home. And he quickly built something temporary, built a temporary structure just to keep them sheltered for the night. And sadly, it lasted longer than a night as he tried to figure out how to recover from this because Bear had kept all of his arrows and his bow and he had no materials with which to make a new bow and arrow. He, he didn't really have the resources he needed to recover. And it turned out that there was a runt in the bear family, the runt of the litter, the youngest bear cub. And the youngest bear cub was frequently humiliated by the other bear cubs and often the object of jokes and mean jokes at that and ridicule because he was the runt of the litter. And as the runt, he also, probably because of, of the trauma of being picked on, he had more compassion than the other bears. And he felt terrible about the eviction of the, of the badger family. And he wanted to take them some food, but he didn't know how because he knew he would get a beating from the other bears if he took food to the badgers, because that was their mindset. And one day he figured out how to just grab some meat, blood clots and all, raw, raw meat to take to the badgers. Not a lot, but something. And he brought it over to the badger. And Father Badger was so grateful, he said, even a little gift is a gift indeed. And so um, we have to, let's, let us pray on this gift that it will grow and multiply. And so uh, Father Badger quickly put up a, an Anipi Kaga structure like I've been showing you, like, it, like is in the picture here. And he heated up some stones and, and he and the little bear cub went inside and, and they brought in the meat and the blood clot. You know, they didn't clean it up at all before they said their prayers over it. 
they just brought it in and they sang and they prayed and and you know breathed in the vapor from the water being thrown on the rocks and 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 felt uh, revitalized and so when they opened the door father badger thought he saw a third person a third being come out of the lodge and he said to little bear did you bring did you bring someone else and the little bear said no and standing before them was a fully formed human male and they're like who are you and the guy says hey he says i came from that blood clot i emerged through the ceremony from that blood clot that you prayed over and i'm here to make things right you watch what we're gonna do and so um the avenger knew how to quickly make arrows and he made the most beautiful arrows and bows and he and badger went hunting and had a great catch of game and when they came back the avenger said let us place this game in front of your former residence which they did and bear came out and bear said hey what what's this a present for me and the avenger said no this is an announcement that you're being evicted this is badger's home and and you took it wrongly and and you must leave you must get out or i will shoot you with my arrows like i shot this game and you will die and all your family will die and bear began to shake bear feared him greatly and he gathered up his cubs and his wife and they ran away into the forest and i don't know what they did there but probably they're still there but the badgers moved back into their home and were very grateful to be comfortable and warm again and to be in a position to reaccumulate the supplies they needed for a hard winter and so that is the start of the Avenger story of, of righting wrongs, of making things right that were wrong, of, of justice, you might say, of um, rendering justice to, to those who have been treated unjustly. And so um, and this is another um, pause point and for discussion and if and potentially a five to 10 minute nature break, as we call it in Maine. Uh, I'm not sure what you call it in England. Tea time, perhaps? Could be tea uh, time, time for a cuppa, yes. Time for a cuppa. Yes. Any discussion or, or thoughts before we break for a cuppa? Oh, I'm enjoying the comment in the chat room where um, Christine's saying such a sweet story. I think this is about one of the earlier ones. I feel like I'm a carefree child again. That's lovely. Stories yeah. do that, don't they? And and I think there, there, there's such a, a beautiful way to teach values because we don't even know that we're learning values. We think we're just being entertained. And 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 we'll talk about this more when we come back from the break. But if we look at the contemporary stories, they're mostly about competition. The contemporary movies are strongly focused on the theme of winning and defeating someone else. And um, individualism, as opposed to collectivity. And, and even some of those stories that relate to teamwork are still about beating the other teams. They're still about competition. And, and that's, I think, what we need to address in the stories that we tell. We need more stories of cooperation and altruism and things like that. So let, let me invite you to take a five to 10 minute break Get yourself a cup of tea and uh, we'll resume at approximately uh, 
9.08 on my watch. <laughs> okay, so eight minutes past. And depending on where we are in the world, we choose our own hour, I guess. Indeed. But let's go for eight minutes past. Thank you, Lewis. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. See you in 10. See you in 10 minutes, everyone. Great. Good. We've got the recording back on as well. Yeah. I think we're good to go. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so now I want to tell a, a story from Europe. And uh, I wanted to, to not dominate with North American indigenous culture. So this is a, a traditional Russian story. And there are three sisters and they live with their father and mother on a, on a farm and um, of modest means. And one day <coughs> the father decides that it's, it's time, you know, he needs to take some things to market and he wants to bring back gifts for his daughters. And so he, so he goes to his oldest daughter and asks her what she would like. And, and she specifies a beautiful dress. And he thinks, well, I can do that. And he goes to his middle daughter and he asks her what she would like. And she would like a, a jeweled hair clip. And he thinks, well, I can do that. And um, he goes to his youngest daughter and he asks her what she would like. And she says, a single red rose. And he says, how am I gonna find one of those? This is not the season for looking for roses. And she says to him, I know you'll find one. I know that one will appear. And he said, well, don't you want something more valuable than that? And she shakes her head, no, this is what I want. This is all that I want. The only thing that I want. And he's, he's, he's like, boy, what am I gonna do? So he says, all right, I'll do what I can. And so he goes, he, he makes his way to the village and he, he sells the things that he needed to sell. And he goes around getting the gifts for his daughters but he can't find a single red rose anywhere. And he's, he's a bit sad about that, but he said he would do his best and you can't do more than that. And so he was on his way out of the village when who should appear but a, a small fellow, um, a little person holding a red rose. And the father looks at him and he says, this is exactly what my daughter wanted. And the little person says, I, I know about your daughter. I, I represent someone who um, has an interest in your daughter. And I will give you this red rose if you will promise her to this, to my master. And the, the, father is thinking, well, how can I promise my daughter to someone I haven't even met? I might be a criminal. He might be ugly. He might be fat. He might be any number of undesirable things. And, and then the father gets the idea that, well, if, if, if he doesn't pass muster, I'll just renege on my agreement. So why not make a deal? And so he shakes on the deal and takes the rose back to his daughter. Now, uh, unbeknownst to him, at, at night, a falcon has been flying into her window and turning into a handsome prince. And they spend the night together I suppose they just talk because this is Russia. <laughs> and 
um, in the morning, he turns back into a falcon and he flies away. And the, the red rose is uh, something that he has asked her to gather so that he can provide her with some of his magic through the rose. And at the same time, the sisters are, her sisters are a little suspicious of what's going on. And they wonder, why doesn't she want anything valuable? Why does she want that silly red rose? And, and why do we hear noise from her room at night when, when it's late? Why, do, why, do, why are there sounds? Sounds like someone is talking. And so the sisters decided to spy on her. And, and what they discovered amazed them. They discovered that there was this falcon that turned into a prince and turned back into a falcon every night, every morning. And there, they became incredibly jealous. They were not at all happy because um, it just, well, it had to mean something. And it had to mean that she was going to have some advantage over them, presumably. And so Sunday came and um, it was time to go to the church for um, whatever they call mass in the Russian Orthodox way. I suppose they call it mass. Uh, or services, perhaps. And, but uh, the young, youngest one didn't want to go. So she stayed home. And once everyone was gone, uh, she used the rose to wish for a carriage and a beautiful dress and a fine hairpin and all the accoutrements that, that, um, you know, a, a high fashion young woman would wear. And she goes to church like that. And she does that three weeks in a row. When she gets home, she uses the magic of the red rose to make it all disappear. But um, the fourth week, she forgets to take the jeweled hair clip from her hair and her, her sisters see it. And they think that's our sister that's been coming to church looking so fine. We're going to teach her a lesson. And so they put um, sharp knives in her window when she's out doing chores so as to wound the falcon when it comes through the window. And that night, the falcon comes through the window and the knives cut it and, it and it backs away and it cannot come through the window completely and it flies off and, and the rose wilts and it has no more magic. And, and the young woman decides when she wakes up in the morning and she sees the blood of the falcon on the knives and she sees that the rose has wilted, she decides that she will follow the falcon to where he lives. And so she gathers what she needs for the journey and um, off she goes. I'm sure like in many stories like this, she probably had seven pairs of shoes and um, all kinds of other things that one would need to walk a really long way. And, and in the Russian stories, they usually walk 40 days to wherever they're going and they cross 40 countries. And by countries, I believe they mean um, like little fiefdoms because these stories came from the days before consolidation. And um, so, so she walks through the forest and she comes upon a hut 
in the middle of the forest um, pointed away from her on tiny stilt, stilts. And those of us who read Russian tales would immediately recognize that as the home of Baba Yaga, the witch of the forest. And so she, knowing that, she asks that the hut turn around and face her, which it does. And, and inside is Baba Yaga. Now, Baba Yaga is, is a complicated character. Sometimes she eats you and sometimes she helps you. I don't know which one it'll be, but uh, to, the, to the benefit of our young woman, Baba Yaga listens to her story, hears her story and says, I'm going to help you. And um, so she says, um, I'm going to give you a horse who can fly. What, you know, and, and this will be, this will help you in your quest. And so she feeds her and gives her shelter for the night. And, and in the morning, a steed awaits her who can fly, which is pretty amazing. You don't see that every day. And off she goes, uh, traveling toward the, the home of the falcon. And, and eventually, she reaches another little hut. And again, she asks it to turn around and face her. And inside is, is this, a sister of Baba Yaga. And again, she shows the sister the horse and tells her the story. And the sister says, well, if my sister agreed to help you, then I will too. And she says, I'm, I'm going to give you uh, a silver urn. <clears throat> and it, it contains a, a never ending supply of butter. And Russians like butter, I might add. And, and they also like mayonnaise. And um, so she says, it'll never run out of butter. And she said, take it because you'll, you'll come upon more of, my, of our sisters and they'll tell you what to do with these gifts. And she, so she takes them and, and she gets, travels again a long distance and gets to the, to the third hut in the forest, invites it to turn around and faces her and inside is a third sister the third Baba Yaga, who sees the urn and the horse and says, well, if my two sisters agreed to help you, then who am I to say no? And she said, I'm going to give you a money clip that never runs out of money. She says, and our youngest sister, whom you'll meet next, will tell you what to do with all these gifts. And off she goes. And eventually she reaches the fourth and final hut. And again, asks it to turn around and face her and encounters the youngest sister of Baba Yaga who says, all right, so here's what's going to happen. You're going to, you're going to arrive at the, at the land and the castle of the Falcon, the Falcon Prince. And he's already engaged to be married to someone else. And, and you're going to, to wait. And, and his bride-to-be will come, will walk past you, and she'll, she'll want um, these fine gifts that we've given you, that we Baba Yagas have given you. And, and you are to give them to her and she'll offer to pay you. But the only thing that you'll want uh, in exchange is to see, is to gaze upon the prince. That's all you'll want. And, and, um, and you'll, you, 
you'll have to do this three times for each gift. And so she continues her journey and she gets to the land of the Falcon Prince and she sits down outside the castle to wait. And who should appear but the bride-to-be uh, walking with her ladies-in-waiting, with her train of servants. And, and she sees the horse that can fly, and she says to um, our heroine, I want that horse. How much can I pay you for that horse? Our heroine says, I will give you the horse if you let me gaze upon the falcon, falcon prince. And the bride-to-be thinks, well, that's an easy deal because she has something that will make it easy for this to come about. She has a hairpin that puts to sleep the wearer. Whosoever is wearing this hairpin, they'll go to sleep and they can't wake up until the pin is removed from their hair. And so um, she puts it in the hair of the falcon prince. He promptly falls asleep and then she brings in the woman, the, our, our heroine, who gazes upon him as promised, tries to wake him up, but he won't awaken. And in sadness, the time runs out and she goes back to, be, to waiting outside. Whereupon she uh, produces her silver, never ending urn, butter churner, maker thing. And um, the next day, the bride to be is walking along again like she was. And she sees this marvelous, shiny object and figures out, she asks what it can do and decides that this would be a great thing to have. <coughs> and she asks to purchase it. And again, our heroine says that all she wants is to gaze upon the prince again. Done, says the bride-to-be. And, and um, again, the hairpin puts him to sleep and the heroine comes in and gazes upon him and can't wake him up and leaves in sadness. Well, the next day it happens again, only this time the bride-to-be sees the money clip and finds it interesting and shiny and asks about it and what can it do. And when she hears what it can do, she thinks, I've got to have that. And again, the only exchange that the young woman, our heroine, wants is to gaze upon the falcon prince again. Only this time while she's gazing upon him, she noticed that there's a pen in his hair. And she thinks, hmm, I wonder if that's pricking him. I'll just pull it out. She does. And he promptly wakes up. And he recognizes her. And he said, I thought you had put those knives up to keep me away. And she says, no, my evil sisters did it. And I've come. I've crossed 40 countries to find you. And I've, I've exchanged, made all these trades with your bride-to-be. And, and he says, he brings her out into the common area of the castle and announces to everyone that from now on, the young woman will be his bride-to-be because she took nothing in exchange for seeing him and gave much, gave up much of value to see him, whereas his former bride-to-be took everything for herself and showed no kindness to anyone else. And so that sort of selflessness is what one wants in a princess, that kind of, of nothing for me, and only to do what needs to be done to see my true love is, is what it is that, that I really want in a bride-to-be. And so they, they married and lived happily, at least until the next story, <laughs> and maybe ever after. <laughs> and so that's a Russian story about uh, 
teaching values, teaching um, that it's that it's better, in a sense, to give than to receive. That selflessness is is rewarded. And maybe we need to to know that to feel that because it's not always obvious at first that selflessness will be rewarded, and yet it was in this story. And of course, it helped that she had some keen powers of observation <laughs> that she had developed as well to see the hairpin. So uh, any any discussion, thoughts, questions, comments about the, the four stories or, or what I've said so far? Thank you, Louis. Thank you. Yeah, let's see. How are we doing as a group, Professor? Anything anyone might want to comment or ask? Or... The, the stories are really different from the, um, as you were saying earlier, Lewis, about competition and uh, even teams or nations competing with each other. And... Indeed. Indeed. It's, oh, sorry, we. I did notice a comment in the chat room, but were you thinking something there, Lewis, before we go to the... Oh, no, no, no. Let's go to the comment in the chat room. Yeah. Well, just, um, cool to see the overlap with a lot of international stories. The Canary Prince, Beauty and the Beast, which is the Welsh version of Cinderella. So. Right, the Beauty Beast. and the Beast. Yes, yes. That is, that is a... Um, a story of of a kind of self sacrifice, isn't it? Yes, in in a sense, the taming of the beast through love. Yeah. Mm. And Michelle, I can see if your camera's just come on, and I wonder whether you wanted to make a comment or and. Sorry to be putting you on this spot if, if that's... No, no, no not, I, not really. I just wanted to turn my camera on while I was listening. Um, I just had it turned off because I, like, literally I was, lying on, <laughs> I was lying on the couch listening. Um, oh, no, I think it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's so... The stories are simple but really deep and thought-provoking. And I'm, I suppose I'm kind of thinking of different contexts in which they apply and also wondering how we might use them with, you know, to help our clients. When we're when we're working, so that's what I'm kind of thinking about. That's a good um, question because I do tell clients stories frequently, and um, I use I try to use stories from their own culture to connect them with their ancestors, whatever their culture may be. Uh, most of my clients now are Wabanaki, so um, I'm mostly telling Wabanaki stories. And sometimes I'll, I'll play dumb and I'll say, oh, you know what? I heard a really interesting story the other day, but I don't know what it means. Why don't I tell you the story and you can tell me what you think it means? You know, because I've been telling it to several people and and people have been trying to figure out what it means and I could use your help in understanding, you know, what do you think it means? And so I've used that as an intro sometimes to tell a story. And it's easier, I think, I frequently tell stories when I can engage people in doing visualizations, which, you know, it, it's a, whatever we call it, guided imagery, hypnosis, visualization, um, trance work. I mean, there's so many different names, all of which are probably trademarked to, for the same you know, phenomena of, of getting people's absorbed attention and, and um, sort of in a, in a Trojan horse-like sense, sending them something positive. Whereas the Trojan horse was not positive. Uh, I think what we're trying to do is embed something beneficial to them into that activity of telling of, of imagery or 
storytelling or, you know, some, some value. And, and um, altruism being a value, you know, that we all need. I mean, I, I sort of picked that because I thought um, as a theme, because I, I thought it was really essential at the current time to human survival that everyone needs a little more altruism. But it could be um, like, a, the, you know, the embedded message could be um, having compassion for yourself or um, looking for being able to get help from others. There's a, there's a marvelous story, a, a Mi'kmaq story about, um, I'm not going to tell the whole story because it takes about half an hour, but I'll just give you the skeletal outline. Um, so um, this little thunder, the, the son of thunder, realizes that um, he and his, and his parents are living by themselves in the forest and, and there's nobody else around. And he brings that to his mother's attention. And she says, ah, you need a wife. And he says, well, where do you get one of those? And so she directs him to Glooscap for instructions. And uh, Glooscap has him complete a number of tasks. And he picks up some colleagues along the way, um, a wolverine and a uh, a guy who can make a huge wind come out of his nostril, and another guy who's incredibly fast at cutting wood. And uh, they all have their um, importance as the story unfolds. And Luscap then gives him instructions for uh, getting to where he'll find a wife. And when he's there, um, he, he saves the life of a young woman. The, of course, in these stories, she's always the chief's daughter. And he saves her life from a horned serpent. And then he's um, rewarded with the offer that she'll be his wife now. And in these stories, they never, of course, ask the woman what she thinks of being his wife. So there's, there's that. But at any rate, the moral of the story is that you, you, you can't do it on your own. You have to get advice from others and, and effort is required and um, you need to do what you're told. So if you're, if you're, you know, the moral of the story then becomes, I would tell it to someone who, who needs other people but who also needs to listen to their advice and to, and to follow that advice, you know? Um, so it, I think we probably know people, um, those of us who work in the psychotherapeutic um, arena, we know people who are, are miserable all the time, but they won't, do anything. So I can come up with 10 assignments of which they'll do none. <laughs> or I can, you know, beg them to go to yoga class, which is both useful and symbolic, and they won't. And, and they just perpetually complain. So, so I might tell a story like the finding a wife story to someone like that, because you actually have to get out of bed and go on a journey in order to get rewarded with what you want. Like you actually can't get there without um, getting out of bed. And the Lord of the Rings is a good story to, to use there too, because um, the hobbits didn't want to go, <laughs> but they went anyway. You know, they rose to the occasion and they did what needed to be done. 
So that's another good story I use for people who are lacking in agency and need to acquire some. Um, so I, I, I think you're getting the idea. You know, it's, it's, it's thinking about what's, what's the secret message that the story can convey? Because if I just tell someone, oh, you need more agency, they're like, right, <laughs> screw you. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's not going to work. But if I tell them a story about a character who, who discovered agency and got the goal, um, it might filter in. It might enter into their awareness. And, and um, you know, I've, I've looked at over time, you know, as I tell these stories, people come back and tell and repeat back to me elements of the stories. So it, it appears that they've absorbed the story or, or some part of it. And, and sometimes the meaning that they get from the story is completely different than the one I imagined that they'll get, but it's perfect for them. And so I've, I re I've realized that um, sometimes you're just moved to tell a story and you don't know why. And it usually turns out for the best. It usually works out great. If, if, if one is drawn to a particular story, you're like, well, I don't know why I'm thinking of this story, but it seems like a great story to tell. So um, what I wanted to do um, before we run out of time is to, is to do a short breakout exercise where uh, I wanted to invite you guys to, to look for stories that teach altruism and concern for others from your own localities and, and backgrounds. And I thought we'd do about a, a 10 minute um, breakout and um, maybe four people per group, Sebastian. And then we'll come back together and talk about what you discovered. And I just invite you to pick one person to represent your group, to talk, to say something to the larger group when you come back. So that, because I want to hear some of the stories that you have that teach altruism and concern for others. So shall we go ahead and do that, Sebastian? Okay. Opening rooms in three, two, one. Hi, Lewis. I think you're muted. Oh, um, can you 